That's right. Okay, I'll get used to this technology. Uh, so basically, I'm going to talk about four, if I have time, four uh, problems we've been working on. There is this, uh, uh, first I'm going to start with two-body physics, which has been a surprise for me that there is some two-body physics related to molecular association already of dimers, which has some surprises and I think some opportunities. Um, and uh, also uh, related to that first topic, uh, an interference experiment I've collaborated with Lev Kekovic on uh, with dimer pathways interfering with trimer pathways uh, that can be achieved by modulating a magnetic field near a, a magnetic uh, funnel Feshbach resonance. Then I plan to talk about uh, some new regimes of the heavy, heavy light uh, FMOV problem that have not yet been uh, probed experimentally. And then I'll have a major detour deviation into Rydberg molecule physics and ghost molecules. And uh, if I have time, I'll say a little about the four neutron uh, problem where we've been trying to understand whether there is a low energy resonance state. Uh, the main collaborator on these first two topics is Panos Giannakis, a really talented postdoc, uh, uh, former postdoc of mine who's now working in Dresden. And um, I encourage you to invite him for colloquy at some of your institutions if you have an opportunity or to conferences. He's really a very talented uh, individual, especially on few body physics, few body theory. And I also wanted to mention um, that uh, uh, he prepared quite a few of the slides on this first part of the talk. Um, and I forgot to tell him about the small screen size, and so th there's going to be a lot of text ir illegible. So don't panic. Look at the pretty pictures. Um, okay, so... Uh, some of my thinking along the line of this two-body uh, association by having an oscillating static magnetic field, static but then modulated uh, at, a, at a frequency that can basically take atoms from a, a free gas of free atoms and associate them into uh, diatomic molecules when you hit the right resonant frequency of the modulation can sort of think of it as a photon, although it's, it's not really propagating electromagnetic waves in the usual sense. Um, there was this experiment by the Wyman group in 2005 that has intrigued me for a long time, um, partly because it has puzzled me for, for a long time, some of the details of the experiment. Um, but basically, they take a gas of rubidium-85 atoms uh, near the famous Fano Feshbach resonance at 155 Gauss and um, do this modulation. This is a region where the scattering length is positive, and so there is a high-line uh, dimer bound state, a universal bound dimer. And um, then they can uh, modulate this field for a certain time. And you see, as a function of coupling time, you can see more and more atoms get converted. And then they claim they can see up to 30% conversion of the uh, atom cloud into molecules. Um, and uh, one of the things that puzzled me is that when they, they blow up a small time portion of this graph, and they say they have this modulating, this very nice thing that they call Rabi-like oscillations. Um, and one thing that always puzzled me is I don't really see how this is going to look like that at small times. Um, so anyway, I think we have some insight in, into that. And uh, let me tell you a little about that story. Uh, so quite a few theorists and, and other experimentalists have tackled this type of problem. I think this paper, last time I looked, had uh, almost 90 citations on the web of science. Uh, probably the most detailed theory that uh, attacks a lot of the same issues as ours is this first reference, uh, 2007 Physical Review A, 
article by Hannah Kohler and, and Burnett. Uh, then there is a, um, other papers, including an, uh, an experimental paper by Debbie Jin's group. And uh, even these authors, Ding, Dian Kao, and Green, in the, their 2017 PRA, they didn't pick up on some of the physics that I think is, is really relevant. Um, so, uh, and there's a preprint on the archive uh, if you're interested in seeing some more of the details. This is currently in combat in physical review letters and it sounds promising from the first referee reports that it will eventually appear. Um, okay, so now onto the slides panels uh, prepared for me. Um, the um, basic idea of this experiment is to start from this gas of free atoms, now have a modulated field pulse, so there's a turn on time and a turn off time. After the turn off time, you look and see how many dimers you have or how many atoms you, you lost and presumably turned into dimers. And we have tried to describe this with the simplest one channel type of Hamiltonian. Uh, a lot of our calculations have, have just been done with a square well um, and then with a uh, uh, modulation of the well depth. We've also done exponential potential and modulated the range. It, it, it doesn't seem to matter much for these one channel models. Uh, you're working in the regime of very large positive scattering length. In the, and so there is a, a molecular bound state you can think of that's being modulated now. Now, one of the things, uh, and, and this cosine squared is just the, the way the turn on and turn off have been modeled. Um, and uh, one of the, 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 the kind of main cartoon of our story is, is in this figure here of what's going on. And the main physics that we've identified that doesn't seem to have been talked about before is that when you have this modulation of the ground state, you might think, okay, you want to tune to resonance with the low energy continuum. And then, uh, you know, if you're at 20 nanokelvin or 50 nanokelvin, these rather ultra cold temperatures, uh, you want to be in resonance with a lot of the population at, at, the, at that energy range to drive them down into the molecular bound state. But if you, if you think of adding a photon energy, again, thinking of h bar omega of the modulation as a photon in our usual photon picture, um, that takes you up to addressed energy, okay, which you, you think you want to lie up here in the continuum. But now the, the, the physics we hadn't considered before, and it's a, the thinking was motivated a bit by ultra-fast uh, experiments and theory is that as you ramp up the intensity, the strength of the drive, often it might be up to 10 or 20 percent of the actual scattering length value, this, the strength of the modulated scattering length. Basically the ground state is going to be pushed down. It's sort of the analog of the AC Stark effect. And at some point it can take the bound state plus omega, which is the dressed energy of the, the dressed bound state, it can take it actually below the dissociation threshold where there are no longer any free atoms to associate. And basically what that does is it makes two pathways. It makes one pathway which is going to follow this adiabatically, sort of, and another pathway that uh, basically is not affected and not brought down below the dissociation threshold. And so one can see Stuckelberg type oscillations when you're in this regime that the strength of the drive is enough to bring this all the way below the dissociation threshold. So I'll show you some of the figures that result from analyzing that, that physics. Uh, this, this is the formula for the AC Stark shift. Basically you can take the it's a second order correction here, just the way it is in AC Stark physics of, of uh, fast laser experiments. And uh, this is a bit challenging to converge because the energy scales from ultra cold to, the, uh, to converge the short range physics is, is a rather different energy range. But you can handle this by Dalgarno-Lewis type ideas and Green's functions and, 
And, and you can calculate this quantitatively. It, it is a negative shift in all the cases we're looking at. So these are, uh, we, so we've done basically two different ways to attack this problem. We have a full numerical treatment, which was very heavy because again, of the very different energy scales. Um, we had to go to very high energies uh, in the basis states to converge this calculation which uh, panels did a, a pretty heroic job doing that. Um, and you can see, if you are in low intensity, you see a curve something like this, with, which is not modulated. And that's basically the regime where you have not come all the way down below threshold. And so you don't have this separate pathway that kind of shuts off the association by one photon, one quantum, uh, when you're in the flat part of the pulse. And basically, when you're in this region at low intensity, just the more time you have, the better, the more molecules you make. But when you go stronger, this is an uh, uh, amplitude of the modulated well, square well depth of 33 kilohertz. This is now 180 uh, kilohertz, much stronger, enough to go below threshold. Now you see the Stukelberg interference oscillations are the, the slow oscillations. The fast oscillations you see here are a two photon uh, interference effect with the one, interfering with one photon cause these fast oscillations. Um, but one of the main things we were trying to understand is under what circumstances does thermal averaging wipe out these oscillations and make them unobservable? But definitely, you can kind of see signs of that now. The, the, the blue is 20 nanokelvin. The uh, yellow is 35 nanokelvin, initial temperature of the gas. And the green is 50 nanokelvin. So they go away pretty fast. Uh, you probably want to be below or around 50 nanokelvin to, to really see this effect. Uh, so there's some math. And there's an approximate model. Um, basically, we do a rotating wave approximation and make a few approximations to get a simpler form that isn't so heavy numerically. And I don't think I need to go through the details of that, except to show that you can capture most of the physics in those heavy numerical calculations. Um, these are the same conditions. The only thing we've lost is by, by doing a rotating wave, we've lost the fast oscillations due to the interference between the one photon and two photon spectra. And uh, this shows the difference, the qualitative difference uh, for a very weak drive versus a stronger drive. Um, what did I want to say about this? I think nothing. Okay, then, then on to the second experiment. Um, well, the other, that was just pure theory uh, so far, what I said. And like I said, I think we understand better the, the conditions of the Wyman experiment. And there were some things about their analysis which we decided were not actually stated in the, in the paper. So I wouldn't take everything too seriously that they wrote about their interpretation. But read our paper. Um, in terms of new... There is some new data that Lev Kekovich has uh, obtained, and there's a new uh, preprint that we also submitted to Physical Review Letters with Lev's group, um, which is on the archive now, and uh, being evaluated also by PRL referees. So the idea of this experiment is, remember the usual dimer and trimer Efimov graph. Okay, so you have um, trimers, this is just a cartoon picture. I don't know why the trimer is going to zero energy at infinite scattering length. That shouldn't do that. But anyway, we're working, thinking over here, a uh, region of positive scattering length where the trimer is a little bit lower energy than the dimer. And the idea is that uh, if you hit this gas of lithium seven atoms with a, the same kind of modulated pulse we talked about before, um, have it on for a brief period with enough, with a, a, a short enough that its bandwidth overlaps both the dimer and trimer, then you can coherently make 
pathways that either go through the trimer or that go through the dimer plus a free atom, just looking at the three atom part of the Hilbert space. And these then uh, can evolve freely until uh, a second pulse, oscillated pulse with a short time, then at that point you do the detection of dimers or trimers and uh, look at the resulting molecules you've formed. So this is the data. It is, I guess, a very low signal to noise ratio and uh, maybe not the kind of data you want to write home to your mom about. But um, anyway, it, they did a pretty careful statistical analysis and although it may not be obvious from this graph, it, it does fit this uh, modulation at the frequency difference between the dimer and trimer energies um, much better than a straight line fits it. Um, so there's pretty high confidence level that this does have a... Um, Lev did that. I don't know many of the details about it. You don't believe it, okay. <laughs> right. in, in fact, the first version we submitted uh, was criticized by referees because we didn't have, he had not done much of a, that sort of analysis. But in the, the resubmitted PRL, um, he has a pretty detailed uh, statistical analysis. It might be a slide, let's see, this is like, okay, fitted amplitude fitted phase of the oscillations, huge error bars. But I, I think at some point, I don't know if it's one of these figures, he's compared to fitting, let me see if I have, no. Compared to a straight line without oscillations. Anyway, there's a pretty high confidence that these oscillations are real. I don't remember the number though. So anyway, there, there are signs of this interference. Uh, obviously, it's a very uh, difficult experiment, and uh, he's hoping to improve the signal to noise. But I can say a little about our picture. We're trying to interpret it, and to be honest, we don't have a very quantitative or detailed interpretation still. But we can see the pathways. One way we've tried to write it is write the hyperspherical potential curves for the atom plus dimer channel and the three body continuum channel, add the photon dressing uh, of those. And now if you blow up the low energy region that, that's really crucial, you see there are light induced uh, avoided crossings between the dimer and the trimer channels and the free atom channels. And uh, so what we're still not sure about is uh, to what extent you can think that there are collisions actually during the time the pulse is on that come through these avoided crossings or to what extent you need to do something like the golden rule to dump amplitude from one channel into another. Anyway, the, 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 the detailed theory is still pretty much in flux, but uh, it seems quantitatively to agree with the, the, the frequency uh, of the difference between the dimer and the trimer and uh, what remains to be done is to predict the amplitude and so on. Okay, yeah. Microphone. Take Randy's, I want mine. <laughs> I just got a little bit lost. So these oscillations, you expect to be uh, dimer trimer. Where were in this picture that you showed uh, the theoretical the curves? Where where was the? Is is it really? Or let me put it this way: Is it really such that everything can be reduced to just two channels here in this? It looks, it looks like it, it looks like more more complicated. Well, or is, or typically, is in the three body continuum, only the lowest continuum channel matters. Okay, so um, this is the dimer channel, which is already, um, yeah, this would be the bare dimer channel, and this is after dressing by a photon, it brings it up to nearly degenerate with the three body threshold. Yeah. And um, so the assumption is that uh, that is an interference between this lowest 
state. Yeah, and, and then somewhere there will be a trimer state uh -huh. in, in these potentials, uh -huh. right? I see. Um, which is also very close on this scale, very close to zero. I see. Uh, is there uh, evidence of a direct association of the trimer from the magnetic field without going through the atom plus dimer? I mean, the oscillation frequency would not work to take the dimer plus atom into a trimer, so I'm not sure I understand. Would there, is there a channel, is there a, a resonance between the trimer and the free atoms? But it's basically within the bandwidth of, of the pulses. It, it overlaps both, both the dimer and the trimer okay. energy. So um, I don't know if they've tried longer pulses. I think they've done a few experiments like that, to, you know, uh, smaller frequency bandwidth, then mm -hmm. they can do one or the other, I believe. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to map out the trimer binding. Mm -hmm. They've, of course, done that in some previous experiments. Yeah. And Selim did Kekovich. that also, yeah. Kekovich and Kekovich did as well in yeah. some earlier experiments. Uh -huh. Okay, okay um, on to heavy, heavy light FMOV problem. Um, let me just remind you two of the main important points to remember whenever you think of the FMOV effect for the homonuclear trimers is that for negative scattering length, large negative scattering length, you have a, an infinite series of, uh, as a function of scattering length, infinite series of resonances. And these resonances have FMOV character. They're basically where the FMOV bound state hits the zero energy continuum or, or low, very low energy continuum. And on the positive side, you see interference, Stuckelberg interference minima uh, due to two pathways that are easy to see in hyperspherical coordinates where the, they can destructively interfere. So we, we've been wanting to see how does this picture generalize to, to heteronuclear systems. And that is, um, of course, a, a large motivation came from the, the two groups that that really saw this heteronuclear FMOV effect in cesium, cesium, lithium, including Matias' group here and Cheng Chin's group in Chicago over the last five years or so. And that both groups were able to see three FMOV resonances and basically confirmed to within experimental error pretty well the, uh, the expected geometric scaling of about a factor of five between successive resonances. And uh, some of the other interesting surprises were that the, quote, first FMOV resonance uh, was, seemed to be missing in the uh, case when the cesium-cesium scattering length was positive. A resonance that was there when it was negative had disappeared. Uh, and uh, we had a physical review letter with them and a follow-up PRA article that gave some interpretation to why that, that was true, which I don't really want to get into now. Um, but basically some of the basic theory of this followed and you could understand already from the zero range hyperspherical potential curves, which are relatively easy to calculate by just solving a transcendental equation. And um, one of the things that we were looking at was um, trying to th understand this point about uh, uh, with, with Matthias' group, the disappearance of the first resonance. And uh, okay, we, again, just some equations to show you we do math. Um, but, um, well, Peter was asking me about this reference. This is where you were asking. Um, how we do use different Jacobi coordinates to do different two-body interaction terms. Um, but uh, the main thing is that this is sort of the topology for three different uh, heavy light scattering lengths. You see the, the potential curves look, they're on, on a kind of strange one-third root scale because the energies get so compressed if you don't do something like that. Where you see the dimer channel, you see the three-body entrance channel with a 
potential barrier that has supports FMOV residences. And then there can also be FMOV residences below the, the uh, dimer, the heavy, heavy threshold. And so sort of what happens as a function of the scattering length is that the states that that first residence is kind of cut off when it hits this, this heavy, heavy threshold. That was our conclusion, which I, st I still think is largely true, although we're starting to tackle this from a different point of view and we'll have some, some more uh, insight into that soon, I believe, but that's not part of today's talk. Um, but in uh, trying to develop a, a, a systematic approach to all of the, the whole range of scattering lengths, that's one difficulty in this problem. There, there's a much bigger parameter space. There's a mass ratio between the heavy and the light atoms. There's, there are two van der Waals lengths. There are two scattering lengths. So there's a lot of parameters. And only a very, very tiny sliver of that parameter space has been seen in the experiment so far. So with Panos, a, f a couple of years ago, uh, we studied this in detail and tried to look at the whole parameter space and in particular some other regions that might be promising for experiments to, to consider trying to get into in the recombination process. Again, recombination means you would come in on the three-body entrance channel and you would go out here on the uh, dimer, one, one of the, the dimer channels. And in this case, we're in the case where the heavy, heavy scattering length is positive, like in uh, Matthias' uh, last experiments on that. But the heavy light is very large and negative. And this is the topology of w the way the potential curves look. And you can see there are interfering pathways in this because you can come in, right, not combine on the way in, but combine, recombine on the way out or you could jump non-adiabatically on the way in and not jump on the way out, the usual type of Stuckelberg interference scenario. And uh, we've also sort of set up a semi-classical modeling of this, which is actually very accurate, uh, that I'll, I'll show you in a minute. This was a PRL, I think it was January last year. Um, so, when we um, calculate this, we can do a, a full semi-classical treatment and, and use all these phases, uh, tunneling factors and so on, and, and get one grand formula for the recombination rate. It's a bit messy, but, but anyway, it, it is actually not so hard to calculate. And we've verified by directly solving the coupled non-adiabatic uh, hyperspherical equations that it gives uh, Pretty, pretty accurate, the same as semi-classical S-matrix theory for this two-channel system. And the most interesting thing, I think, is figures like this, which show now the whole topology on the negative scattering length side for lithium cesium as a function of this coordinate, um, divided by the, scat the positive scattering length for cesium cesium. And then this R0 is something like the three body parameter divided by the heavy, heavy scattering length. And so now on this, you see what is interesting that has changed from the homonuclear where you either had resonances or you had Stuckelberg minima. Now they are both intertwined in an, uh, for what to me is a very interesting way that um, the experiments to date are taking sort of one slice, one cut, uh, varying largely this axis. Um, and so they're not seeing the minima, they're seeing resonances, like in uh, the experiments Matthias' group did. Um, but in principle, if one could find either other resonances or other, other regions of magnetic field, that, or, or an alternative way to get a different, like RF modulation of the scattering length, one could imagine taking other cuts across here which would see the minima as well as the, the resonances. So this, this change in the topology surprised me. And, and this is just a verification that the uh, semi-classical and the, the full numerical treatments are really giving quite good agreement. Let's see, I think 
Oh, and then we did a Jose Dinkow type model of this, uh, where you kind of break this into piecewise sections and to, to see how things scale with scattering length. And that might be a useful guide to experimentalists, which is also in our, in our PRL. Um, okay, so I think I'm ready to talk about Rydberg molecules. Um, there are a couple of things I wanted to discuss. Uh, one is especially, um, I think I won't cover this item too about FMR physics with a, an electron, which uh, I published in an article in Fizreve with Huili Han, a Chinese collaborator in 2018 on that if you're interested. But uh, I'll talk instead about a, a physical review letter we, I published with my student Matt Eilis last fall about ghost trilobites. Uh, okay, so this is uh, on some of the Rydberg molecule stuff. I also collaborated with uh, Jesus Perez Rios and uh, Matt Eilis is the student who recently graduated and is now uh, sort of in a Humboldt postdoctoral fellow in Dresden. Um, okay, and here are a few recent reviews um, of both Rydberg molecules. There's uh, one in Nature Communications uh, by two of my former students and, and Jim Schaefer. And there are also some few body review articles mentioned here. If you're fast, you caught them all. Okay, and of course, um, I have to mention this paper, which is doing Rydberg nuclear molecules, um, which is kind of based on a similar idea of scattering of the light particle that is producing a binding mechanism for the, the heavier particles. In this case, two beryllium-10 nuclei are speculated to be bound by two neutrons uh, through similar types of contact interaction as we're using in the Rydberg molecule business. The only thing I don't like about this paper is I don't think you should call it Rydberg because to me, Rydberg means an attractive Coulomb potential. But except for that, I'm, I think it's an interesting paper. Okay. Um, so the basic idea of this is, uh, as you know, if you have a, a particle roaming through a gas of atoms like an, an electron in a Rydberg state of an atom, uh, every time it encounters one of these atoms, Fermi taught us that it acquires a phase, and that phase translates into an energy of interaction. You can really recast that phase shift acquired during a, an electron perturber atom scattering, ground state atom scattering. You can recast that as a direct delta function term in the Hamiltonian to a good approximation. This is the usual Fermi term written in atomic units. Uh, more generally, it's 2 pi a h bar squared over the reduced mass of the collision. And of course, it, it can be regarded as an energy dependent quantity if you don't take the way one often does the zero energy limit of it. It's, it's useful in this business to regard it as a function of energy. Uh, there is a correction term, a P wave correction term, which is also sometimes important, and rarely have we had to consider D wave or higher. And this involves the P wave scattering volume defined. Okay, and these are defined in terms of the S wave phase shift divided by either K or K cubed. Um, so if you take that potential of the electron and a per Rydberg electron and a perturbing atom, in first order perturbation theory, like say you have a NS Rydberg state, you can just do first order perturbation theory and you see the Born-Oppenheimer potential curve will simply, when you do a matrix element of a delta function, it'll just be the radial wave function squared. And so you'll get Born-Oppenheimer potential curves that oscillate and look just like a wave function, actually. They look like the electronic wave function. And there's an S wave and a P wave term. Um, by now, there are many groups that have actually looked at these. Uh, uh, I think that's a fairly up-to-date list, unless I've forgotten some. And quite a few different theory groups, including Peter here, uh, have, have looked and uh, extended the theory in many ways. Um, 
But this, this is a graph from our original prediction in 2000 that I wrote with Alan Dickinson and uh, my former student, Hossein Sargapur, showing that you could get these oscillating potential curves and they are deep enough, at least for these, these mass atoms, to, to bind and make uh, bound molecular states out at around 1,500 bore or larger. And this is the first experiment uh, or a graph from the first experimental observation in Tillman Fowles' group where they ob observed it for an S state, a rubidium S state. Uh, here's the potential curve and here is what the wave function looked like that they, they had. And since then there have been other observations, Reitel's group in Michigan, Merkton and Deigelmeyer, And uh, some other developments, which are pretty nice, but I haven't wor published on myself, are now you can also trap more than one atom in those wave functions. Here's the dimer energy. Here's the trimer shifted twice as much away from the bare atom, and then tetramer and so on. They can really identify a whole sequence of polyatomics associated with this kind of physics. And the theoretical description is, is doing a really nice job work by Schmidt, Sarigpur, and Demler. But um, this, this simplest scenario I regard as rather boring because first order perturbation theory is, is not anything that excites any theorist, okay? We're kind of embarrassed but we have to do it, okay? It's much more interesting when you have a degenerate situation, especially a highly degenerate situation. And then I think that leads to what I regard as sort of an oxymoron that actually degenerate perturbation theory, when you have a high degeneracy, can describe some really seriously non-perturbative physics. And the quantum Hall effect is a perfect example of that, the fractional quantum Hall effect. So here's what happens if you look at the high all states with negligible quantum defect. You see a couple of orders of magnitude deeper potential wells. You see much stronger interaction many more vibrational bound states. And the wave function shown here of those kind of states looks very different from the unperturbed atomic states. And that's reflecting the fact that when you have a high degeneracy, all these states can hybridize to, to put density on top of the, the ground state atom. And they do that in this lowest energy state in each manifold. Uh, it took a while for that to be observed experimentally, but it was finally seen in 2015 by Jim Schaefer's group at, at Oklahoma, verified that this trilobite state could be seen. They could verify it by the energy shift, agreeing with theory. They didn't actually image the, the wave function, though. That's a theory, theory reproduction of the wave function. And you see how different it is from, say, an S state of the Rydberg atom. Um, another important thing to mention is that uh, there is a, a P wave shape resonance in electron scattering from all the alkali atoms. And uh, this is what it looks like in electron rubidium scattering uh, around 20, 30 milli eV. This resonance shows up in the potential curves through that P wave Omont pseudo potential term. This is the triplet S that would be in the normal Fermi pseudo, uh, pseudo potential. And you can see that triplet physics, triplet P physics is gonna be very important at, in, even at, fairly, at rather low energies because of this resonance. And here's the effect of that resonance. It, this rise of the phase shift with energy in electron atom scattering shows up as a decrease as you come to smaller internuclear distances because the energy of the electron collision with the perturber is higher and higher as you go to smaller internuclear distances. And you basically see this, uh, what we call the butterfly potential curve in particular with a very small internuclear distance minimum. And this is a essentially simultaneous prediction of the same effect by Fabricant's group. And this is what the wave function looks like and why we call it a butterfly molecule. Okay, so that's all old, old stuff, except uh, maybe it's only three years old that Hervigat first observed these butterfly molecules and had a nice experiment. 
could see that uh, very, very clearly. And also they have very large dipole moments. He could actually see the quantized energy levels in these individual potential wells, see that they respond to an electric field and how their rotational spectrum fans out into a stark molecular stark spectrum, which is just the pendulum Hamiltonian, a dipole in an electric field. It's the same Hamiltonian for a pendulum on the surface of the Earth. Um, so that all came together well, and the dipole moments more or less agreed with theory, and they had a, a nice paper by Herr Vigot's group that we co-authored in 2016. Um, but now let me tell you about the new development that we published just last fall about the ghost trilobite chemical bond. And the idea of this came from thinking a little about what does it mean to have degenerate states? It means any linear combination of a set of degenerate states is also an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian, right? It's a stationary state. It doesn't matter what, what it is. We're used to think of, of a, say, for a hydrogen atom, we're used to thinking of, say, 30S, 30P, 30D in this representation, but there are others. It's also separable in parabolic coordinates where you have Stark-type quantum numbers in the C and eta coordinates. There's also spheroidal coordinates, elliptical coordinates, you can separate the Schrodinger equation of the hydrogen atom. Those are just three choices, but out of this degenerate manifold, any linear combination is an equally valid stationary state eigenfunction of the Schrodinger equation at the same energy with the same time dependence that just has a time independence uh, den density. So what it occurred to us is maybe it's possible to create this trilobite chemical bond between a Rydberg atom and a distant ground state atom to recreate that even if that atom is not there. And that was our goal, to see if we could do that, if we could find a sequence of field pulses that would engineer this quantum state. And it'd be, so it's like making a chemical bond without another atom there to bind to. And uh, we, we were able to, to do that. Uh, we tried, first of all, to just sort of randomly search through a sequence of electric and magnetic field pulses. Uh, mostly, the part of the, the magnetic interaction we care about here is the diamagnetic term in the Hamiltonian, just to make that clear. It's not a Zeeman effect. It's the diamagnetic term, which does not commute with the electric field operator. So we tried just randomly searching through the m equals zero subspace of the degenerate uh, uh, Rydberg atoms of hydrogen to see if we could make it. And it could get about 80% of the trilobite that way, but it wasn't really too convincing that a random search was the way to go. So we tried to get a little more clever and use gradient ascent algorithm, which is sort of the simplest machine, <laughs> machine learning type algorithm to steer, uh, to find a sequence of field pulses that could make that. And after studying a lot of the things like what time scale can you really ramp on a magnetic field off and on and an and, and electric field, the sweet spot seemed to be that we, pr in the end, propose the following scenario, uh, again, for a hydrogen atom, to use two photon excitation of the ground state from 1s up to, say, 70s. Um, and then have a fairly slow ramp on of a static magnetic field um, up to around 100 Gauss, which would then be held fixed until the end, pole, end, end of the sequence. And then have a sequence of electric pulses going on and off for varying time intervals. Uh, and basically we'd set some number of pulses and then we'd try to find the properties which would create the best overlap with the trilobite wave function. Five yeah, minutes. Uh, quick question, Chris. So is the um, electric field and magnetic field uh, polarized along the same axis? Yeah, yeah. So we're preserving the M quantum yeah. number, M sub L quantum number. And uh, then after the sequence of electric field pulses, we have a slower ramp down of the magnetic field uh, 
so we're trying to avoid having to pulse on and off very suddenly the uh, the magnetic field, which is can lead to induction issues, and I think is difficult to achieve experimentally. Much harder than doing electric field pulses on a short time scale. Okay, so with that, we found we could make basically any state we want out of this de manifold, this uh, set of degenerate m equals zero states. We could make the um, this is is uh, an example of making the trilobite. This is the way we usually plot it. It's it's actually a figure of rotation about this axis. So in these figures, we're actually showing it as a cutaway uh, in three dimensions, but. Basically, this is that, just plotted differently. And as time goes on, after the B field ramp, you get a state that doesn't look very much like a trilobite. Then you do the electric field pulses. And then the final B field ramp, it's starting to look a little more. But finally, at the end, you, you have the trilobite to something like 99.9% .9 purity. And uh, this whole experiment, as for this scenario we proposed in our, in our physical review letter, might be, I don't know, tens or hundreds of microseconds, I think. So these are just some details on how we set up the Hamiltonian, the time propagation, and everything. Uh, not too, too interesting. I think once you see the basic idea, the math is, is fairly simple. Um, this is what uh, like the sequence of pulses look like. And you can see the overlap with the trilobite as a function of time basically stays below 1% or so until the very final pulse. It's, and this is, I think, often the case in quantum control uh, theory and, and experiments that uh, you, you try to make an outcome, but it, it really doesn't look like the desired outcome until the very end. Um, so we also showed you could make a, a triatomic ghost molecule. Again, there's only one atom here, so these bonds are binding to nothing. Why you would want to do that, I don't know. But I don't know, to me it was interesting that you could do that. And you could make the butterfly, you could also make a stark state if you want, and uh, they all look quite different. Uh, we proposed also a couple of different ways you might detect to test whether you had actually made this. Maybe I won't get into that. Um, they're both pretty difficult experiments, but in principle, they could be, you could measure that. Okay, maybe do I have a few minutes just to talk about the tetraneutron? Okay, so the tetraneutron project is a theory project I've been engaged with Alejandro Kievsky and Michaela Viviani. Uh, we have not submitted anything yet on this, so, so don't rush out and scoop us. Um, it's motivated to a large extent by a recent experiment um, in Japan that they measured a, a reaction of nuclei which looked as though they provided evidence that four neutrons came out together at low energy with around uh, one MeV or so of t total energy of the four neutrons. And this they interpreted it as a possible either bound state or a resonance state of the four neutrons, which was surprising to a lot of people. And so, of course, theorists, many theorists jumped in to try to understand it. And about half of the seven or eight papers I've seen published on this, about half of them say there is a resonance at low energy. And about half say there is not a resonance at low energy. It's almost exactly half and half. So we have our own toolkit. This is, I think, one of the most re reputable uh, theorists working on the problem, Del Tuvi. He has a tremendously good track record. Um, he says there is no, no four neutron resonance and also no three neutron resonance. So, but hyperspherical coordinates in atomic physics has a really good track record. It's predicted resonances in H minus. This is Chi Dong Lin's famous one in H minus predicting the shape resonance and a rise by about two radians with energy of the phase shift. We had a similar prediction. My first PhD student, Javier Botero from Colombia, saw that the physics in positronium negative ion is quite similar. We predicted a shape resonance and that was confirmed just a couple of years ago by a, a Japanese group. 
And we also, in this calculation, saw a rise of about two radians. You would normally think in isolated residents, you'd like to see the phase rise by pi, but in, um, uh, in many practical cases, real cases, it only rises by about two radians and doesn't get up to three. So we've tackled this using the toolkit, the hyperspherical harmonic expansion method that the PISA group has developed over the years. And a difficulty with it is it's really hard to get totally accurate convergence. Um, but we can actually learn a lot, I think, about this, even from slightly unconverged calculations. These are potential curves, hyperspherical potential curves in the lowest channel for uh, J equals zero, even parity for neutron systems. It's, you can think of it as two spin up, two spin down neutrons um, at different levels. And the potential curves, of course, are always getting lower, more attractive as you increase the number of hyperspheric harmonics. So this lowest blue curve is the most uh, converged potential curve and the one to uh, pay most attention to. If there was no interaction, we know this potential curve would look like this blue curve. And so when you calculate phase shifts, you're finding the extra phase in this, say, blue potential compared to the non-interacting potential. And it is known, just as a parenthetical aside for uh, cold atom people, this is what it should look like if all the scattering lengths were infinite, this gold curve. So, and, and we know the neutron-neutron singlet scattering length is, is quite large and negative, like minus 18 fermis. Uh, so here is our phase shift calculation, again, for uh, five different levels of convergence. The resonance-like rise of phase by around two radians or more uh, is that rise moves, it's, it, it's monotonically going to move to lower energy. That's guaranteed by the variational upper bound principle of, of this uh, phase shift calculation. And this is the time delay, which is like the energy derivative uh, in, in zeptoseconds, energy derivative of the phase shift. And you can see certainly there's signs of a resonance from the, both the criteria of having a maximum in the time delay and from the criterion of having a rise of phase by more than two radians. So this is certainly a resonance or a resonance-like feature. There is basically one extra state in the continuum. Um, if we try to extrapolate to full convergence, this is the trend we see for the resonance positions. Our most converged point is slightly below 2 MeV for the resonance or resonance-like position. But it seems clear that any reasonable extrapolation would come down to this sort of range uh, around, well, we quote a, a rough error bar on the extrapolation around 0.6 plus or minus 0.3 MeV as a function of the inverse of this maximum K. And of course, we're trying to get here infinite, conver infinite basis. So anyway, that is basically all I wanted to tell you about today or I don't know how to pronounce smorgasbord in Swedish, but I guess I'll use the American pronunciation. Um, these are the topics, and I'll just leave you with some of our other uh, recent work that I didn't have time to cover today. So happy to entertain questions. All right, we have plenty of time for questions. Jose? Hello. Uh, can I think in terms of a mass for this ghost particle or? or? It's a particle, it's an electron. Okay. And the, and you can have can you have many states for this like like if there were an energy spectrum or is it just one single actually state? Be, because there's no atom to interact with out there uh, these are all 
exactly at the energy of the unperturbed hydrogen atom. Hmm. Uh, at least when the fields are off, at least when the field. No, 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 but eventually it was ramped off. At, at the end, it's, there's no fields. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's why we propose it for hydrogen. And one would have to think about the quantum defects if one did another atom. Okay. And uh, it, like this molecular state, right? Can, can you study collisions of atoms with this molecule? I uh, think so. But the minute any atom started exerting any Hamiltonian, it would probably rearrange the degenerate states into like adiabatic eigenfunctions of that new Hamiltonian. So I'm not thinking, unless you did a very high energy before the way the, the system sort of its inertia prevented it from rearranging. Okay. So that's why our, our proposed ways to detect this yeah, are very so high energy, that. either like E to E or, or diffraction with light. Okay. Along the same lines, what is the required field stabilities that you require in uh, in order to have the state to become really, let's say, stationary or a state that is not permanently? Yeah, uh, I think all of this is, is is challenging um, experimental capabilities. We had some estimates in the paper, and I don't remember real well, but I think it might have been of the order of a tenth of a millivolt per centimeter kind of stability control. Yeah, yeah, but for, for this case, we looked at it in the most detail, n equals 70. So in the back. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's about the tetraneutron. I think it's surprising that uh, you got an extrapolation that is very low while, uh, as, as far as I remember, the Utuva calculated and they only could find a resonance that is much higher in energy. But I see that your extrapolation may have a error band that may go up to two MEVs or, or something like that. So perhaps... Um, well, Del Tuva didn't... Yep. He claimed there was no resonance at yes, all. Yes, yes. He claimed but there was some low energy, low, low energy energy dependence of the scattering amplitude. But yes, he claimed but there if, was no resonance. If I'm not mistaken, he he played with uh, with the interaction strength, and for some interaction strength, he got a resonance that is much higher, and that's what I'm. Oh, with I'm the modified Hamiltonian. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I didn't pay too much attention to that because because okay. we're we're really working with the real Hamiltonian, or uh, what we think. Yeah, is yeah, a, I understand. A, a very realistic Hamiltonian. Yeah, and and. Well, I saw I saw your talk at the Few Body Conference, and I, I and you I didn't believe the, it then either. I, I followed the discussion, and I mean, it, well, the, well, the Tova has a pretty powerful tool for calculating those uh, four-body resonance and stuff like that. Indeed, so, and it's surprising that you, both of you, disagree because hyperspherical is also. Uh, very well established, and I think the suggestion is to make a benchmark uh, all, all, all of the groups choosing the same Hamiltonian and see the, if the, the techniques agree, and then from that choosing... Um, I, I agree that that's desirable, but I think we want to publish our result first. Mm -hmm. And okay. then we'll think about benchmarks. And, and how? But but you don't include any three-body force. Actually, we have done the, some uh, estimates of the three-body, and it seems very weak in this system. Uh, so the final calculations I've shown here have left it out, just because that speeds up the whole pro process of calculation. But they were very very weak in the four-neutron system. Okay. Thank you. Just to let me uh, make a comment. Uh, I think Emiko uh, Hiyama and also Kievski proposed such a benchmark calculation. But uh, just to let me know, what's your opinion about uh, so different conclusions? Because uh, I, I don't know, they are all of this paper are using exactly the same potential to calculate. Uh, what's the origin of such well, a disagreement? Well, I, I can speculate a little bit. Uh, Del Tuva does not calculate the total scattering amplitude. I think he's calculated a few isolated like angles and momenta. 
um, whereas we have the total. Okay, so for instance, if this resonance had very poor coupling to the momenta he calculated, he, he would have a hard time seeing it. That's one way that the two calculations could potentially not contradict each other. But again, it, it would take sort of an accident that he picked angles in his differential cross section that don't couple to the resonance. Um, it's either that or, I mean, we, ha we have done other benchmarks, like we get the right binding energy of the triton with this method. So I have a lot of confidence in it. I mean, there, to be honest, there is one of the three criteria I like to think of that a resonance should normally obey, a shape resonance. Um, and there's one it does not. Usually I think if there's a resonance, there should be a potential barrier that you have to tunnel through. And this, at least at our most converged calculation, it is not showing such a barrier. And, but there is X, the extra time delay and there's an extra density of states there. So I think at the very least we can call it resonance-like because the integral of the density of states is almost, you know, it's 90% it's of a full state, just the way it is in H minus and positronium minus and other shape resonances. So there's something there in that continuum and I think it's, it's, it's not crazy to call it resonance-like, but it it does bother me that there is no potential barrier that traps, that really causes trapping. So if it is a resonance, it's, it's, it's just a little extra time spent inside than it would if it was a non-interacting system. So Chris, is there any possibility of resolving this experimentally? Um, there are some, you know, things like muon capture, some experiments that might produce a four neutron system at low energy. There are other, uh, I think the way the first experiment saw it was in like colliding beryllium eight with alpha particles. And I think there are some other analogous experiments planned. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, there's ongoing work. I know at least two or three groups, I believe are, are working on this, maybe you, maybe you know. But uh, I think there's a group in France and, uh, and the group in Japan, at least two. So the experimentalists will hold your hand to the fire. They will, yeah, they'll, they'll make us accountable. Okay. Any other questions? All right, if not, let's thank Chris again. Thanks. All right, let's go ahead and get started then. So our uh, last speaker of this session is Marcos Miotti. And uh, Marcos is at uh, Sao Carlos, and he'll talk about global variable thermodynamics to investigate the critical behavior of a non-uniform Bose gas. Marcos? Well, thanks for this workshop. I really uh, enjoy to be here. And uh, this is really a pleasure for me as um, I am a senior undergrad, so it's a great opportunity to be here and being, you know, presenting this work that's quite important and we, have very exciting results about this. So I'm not going to talk anything about uh, the tur turbulent clouds or anything that uh, Vanderlei has told you uh, on Monday. Uh, these things are, are all about uh, in equilibrium. And uh, the main idea is we are going to, to study here the thermodynamics of a non-uniform Bose gas, especially in the case of a, a harmonically trapped uh, Bose gas. And uh, this is me, and first, the second is uh, our postdoc, uh, Polish, uh, Michał Hermling. Uh, he's attending a, a another conference today. Uh, this is the, our former postdoc, um, Milson Fritz. He's now in NIST uh, in Maryland. And this is our PhD student, Arno Garcia, uh, could not be here. And this is our staff, Gustavo Teles and Professor Vandele Bagnato. So, uh, I, I will give a brief introduction about this topic concerned to phase transitions and uh, critical phenomena. Just a brief topic. And uh, the whole thing is that um, most of research is uh, focused on the homogeneous systems, and we are studying here a non-homogeneous system. Then there are two main approaches that I'm going to talk about. That one is I, I, was, I will pass through very briefly. 
This is the local dense approximation. And, and the other, which is the main approach, the approach we, we used for the results presenting, uh, that we were presenting here, is the global variable approach that has been developed in 2005. And uh, I will present you this approach. You, I, th I, I don't think you m may know it. It's not really very, uh, spread among the community. And, uh, and then I will show you the, the results. This is mainly, uh, this project uh, we just finished uh, is mainly for now, uh, we have just experimental results. Uh, we, are still, uh, we are still going to preparing the theoretical part, uh, theoretical part like uh, the, the simulations to to uh, reproduce our experimental results. So here I will just show you experimental uh, results. And, uh, and uh, we use two approaches for this. This is the Fitian approach and the least square interpolation approach that I will present you how we have done this. So let's go. Um, when I was preparing this presentation, I was really uh, amazed that uh, phase transition does, does not happen only in the classical physical system, like in the liquid helium. This is the very well known the uh, heat capacity profile for liquid helium. This is a lambda peak, but I I, I found that uh, phase transitions also happen even in, in biological systems. So the system, the uh, microbiological systems with DNA, uh, uh, proteins, uh, biological proteins, also present phase transition in their heat capacity. So we see here that uh, it's not only in the classical uh, fields of physics that appears those phase transition, but also in many other areas. And this is interesting because uh, we can uh, uh, can use many concepts that we have in the, uh, in the classical physics, in the, in the classical uh, fields of physics, uh, to other systems. So, uh, we know that critical phenomena uh, that are qu quite related to phase transitions are, are trends in the current physical research. And the interesting thing about the, uh, those critical phenomena, they they can be grouped in uh, universality classes. So many kind of different phenomena can be described by the same physics, even not being the not being the the same uh, kind of system. So you can group them. It, it, they are all described by the same equations, all the same physics, even being of very different uh, systems, kind of physical systems, and. Of course, uh, as they can be in many different fields. So we have the usual physical physical system, biological system, as, as I just show you. But even in economics and sociology, you can have uh, phenomena that can be described by uh, the, uh, the critical phenomena approach. But the thing is, most of the studies, as I just told you, are restricted to homogeneous systems. So, uh, because it's easy, of course, to work in, with homogeneous systems. And, but the idea here is to break those shackles and go, uh, go to a non-homogeneous system. So the, the most known approach in the forest set kind of uh, non-homogeneous systems is the local density approach. So basically the idea is to write down the, the let's say we have a physical system that, that has some density. Let, let's think about a, a fluid like a gas or even a liquid, a simple liquid. And so we have a density and we can express this density as a, as a function of the external potential that is confined in this fluid, this, uh, the, the potential that uh, the fluid uh, is undergoing. So we can express its total pressure as integral of this density in, in the in the uh, potential, and you know this this has units of, of pressure. It, it's quite easy to check it here, um, uh, and from from this approach, we can determine other uh, thermodynamic quantities like the the uh, isothermal compressibility and uh, isothermal um, isobaric expansion and such things, and they are all determined in terms of density. But the thing is. This pressure, the, this total pressure in the system, is not the pressure in the thermodynamic sense. That means that we cannot use this pressure, this total pressure, to express the, the work differential. So this is not valid. 
the, we can we could use this part of equation lo uh, locally as the as some uh, uh, work differential, but it's not valid. This this uh, the, this formulation is not valid for the total pressure. That means that uh, the thermodynamic laws are not valid uh, uh, everywhere in the in the system. They are only valid locally. So we need to evaluate the system like for uh, almost infinite number of uh, uh, regions that are, are the thermodynamic would be valid. So um, to in order to as we have this problem, okay, this is a, this is a valid approach, but uh, it somehow so we we see here we have we we don't we don't have the, the thermodynamic laws uh, available for the whole system. So the idea uh, of uh, Professor Romero from Mexico in 2005, he, in fact, uh, Professor uh, Bagnato also worked with him in the formulation of this uh, math, this global variable math. So the basic idea is to identify in a non-homogeneous system what are the variables that can be used uh, uh, for volume and pressure. Uh, so they 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 are looking that uh, there must be some values at the inside a non-homogeneous system that will behave like the volume and the pressure for a, in the for in a homogeneous system. So uh, let's start with an example. So they consider uh, for the in first case they deal got both gas in a harmonic trap. So these are just definition. This is the geometric mean of, of the frequency, the trap frequency. So we have a harmonic potential, um, and this is the Bose function, as you know. Uh, so uh, we can express the 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 grand potential as as, uh, as this formula uh, using the thermodynamic limit, the total number of atoms in the system, and also the entropy. You see here um, the important thing: all those quantities are extensive, so uh, we know that depends on the number of atoms, and uh, and so they they can be written uh, if we multiply n of them by a a, 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 a dimensional term, they will be all shifted by this term, as we know that is the property of uh, extensive uh, variables. But the thing is, as those variables are extensive. In this part of this, those equations, there must be some other variables here that are also extensive. And being as extensive means that uh, they can be related to volume. It turns out, I, I will show you right now, that this variable, the, the frequency, the geometric mean of the frequency, are, would be equivalent to volume in, in, uh, in this system, as this system will, can be considered as a homogeneous system. So. We see here, if we consider a diabetic process, we are going to see here that uh, this is the equation for the diabetic. So we see that uh, the geometric mean is a, is a thermodynamic variable, right? Uh, it, 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 it's part of, of, of this equation to, of the equation of diabetic. So it, it must be, have some thermodynamic meaning. And uh, another thing is, in a harmonic trap, we know the, that the gas occupies the whole space. It does not, it is not a fixed in uh, just a position of the space. But we know that the volume mostly occupied by this, uh, this gas obeys the, uh, more or less this equation. And we see here that that is a dependence uh, with, with the geometric mean of the frequency. So uh, as, as, as this part of the, the equations are extensive, and there must be some extensive value in this part. We we can identify uh, in this system that the the inverse of the of the cube of the geometric means of the frequencies is an extensive uh, thermodynamic quantity. And then uh, uh, once we identify this, we can uh, write down the volume parameter that is uh, is defined as this. And then. As now we have volume, we must uh, find the, its counterpart, its thermodynamic counterpart, that's pressure. And then we can really see that if we make the derivative of the grand, uh, the grand potential 
uh, with respect to the volume here, keeping the temperature and the chemical potential constant, we, we, we found this, uh, this expression that is equivalent to, uh, to pressure. And it's as the, we called the, the extensive variables volume parameter, this is the pressure parameter. And uh, we, we see here that with, if we take the thermodynamic limit, we make the number of atoms going to infinity, and then as the potential must uh, be weakened to, in order to the gas be occupy the whole space, we see here that uh, the, the, this uh, is kept constant. So we have n over the volume parameter, that's basically the density parameter of this system, is kept constant. And once we identify this, we see here that in this non-homogeneous system, in this, um, in this uh, harmonic tra harmonically trapped uh, Bose gas, we can write the pressure parameter and uh, uh, times the, the uh, differential of the volume parameter as the, as the work differential. And this means that the harmonically trapped gas is homogeneous in the global variable picture. And this is quite powerful uh, method because now we have all the thermodynamic relations that were, were unvalid before to homogeneous system, and we c could f find out how to write this for a, a non-homogeneous system. We now have all the, uh, the thermodynamics here. And then the paper that, that I just shown you uh, extend this to weakly interacting gas. And it, uh, it finds out that to keep the equilibrium of the fluid, uh, the, the force that the fluid pushes the potential, it, it must obey this equation that is valid for ideal and weakly interacting uh, fluid, fluids. Uh, so we see here that the integral in the whole space of, of the real density, the, the per, uh, atoms per, per unit of volume, times the, the external potential integrated all over the, sp the space. And uh, we can find this way the equation of state of the system. And it, it has been shown uh, that the, in a paper of our group that the energy of, the, of a weakly interacting gas in a harmonic trap obeys the, the, this equation. This would be a, a equal in the case of ideal gas, but it's, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this approach, approximation is very good to describe uh, weakly interacting, uh, uh, weakly interacting gas. And then, once we have the the equation of state and the internal energy, we have all the thermodynamic of the system. So we can uh, we have described completely all this, uh, the behavior of the the thermodynamic behavior of this system. So, um, uh, as I just show you this approach, uh, we have we have some uh, recent publication using it. Well, most of our publications are 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 on tur turbulent uh, uh, turbulence, uh, quantum turbulence, and well, uh, this is the main focus in our group in the last years. But we have uh, we have done some some work on this uh, global variable math. So uh, the last paper is the as. Uh, uh, isobaric expansion. I put this isobaric uh, uh, among this, this uh, just to show you. This, this, this pressure parameter is not really, uh, does not have units of pressure, but uh, one, once you multiply it by, by the volume parameter, it has units of energy, as all the canonical ver uh, thermodynamic variable must be. Uh, but just, just that's the reason I, I include th those things here. And we, had, uh, we have also found the speed of sound in a superfluid. And uh, the zero temperature effect, we, I, I, I will show you uh, this too. We, we could find the, the, the zero temperature uh, pressure for, 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 for uh, weakly interacting gas. And also the heat capacitor for the system that I will, I will show you uh, today. And of course, the, we proved the, this equation of state and it follows the, the behavior it should be. And oh, now an uh, uh, interesting curiosity. So uh, this, this is the case of internal, uh, this is the uh, part of, of pre uh, pressure parameter times the, times the volume parameter, as I just show you here. But this is equal because uh, it's, it's the ideal gas case. And uh, 
Uh, below the critical temperature, we know the Bose function becomes the Heeman's data function. And then th this is the equation that we have. But it's interesting to notice that uh, it has some, uh, this, this obey a T24 behavior, and uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law also obeys a T24 behavior. So it's interesting that uh, once we have uh, I, uh, massive bosons, uh, no interacting massive bosons below the critical temperature, they behave as uh, massless relativistic particles, just as a photon are. Uh, so it's just a curiosity, but uh, it's very interesting to note, notice this, this uh, kind of thing. Very, very interesting uh, coincidence. So I will show you now, I will present you now our science chamber, how we perform the measurements. So here, uh, this is the sci uh, science chamber, uh, is, a, is a vacuum cell uh, where we trap the, the Bose gas in order to Bose condense it. Uh, we have here the, per, the pairs of the, the coils to, that, that uh, create magnetic field for the uh, magnetic trap. So our, all our measurements here have been performed in a magnetic trap. And uh, well, we see here that those are the exciting coils that uh, we produce the, tur the turbulent measurements, but uh, we are we not used we have not used them in this experiment as they have been done only in equilibrium. And uh, uh, so the the atoms comes from the y direction, uh, uh, so so they they are pushed from uh, an, uh, from another uh, magnetic trap that um, uh, from a magnetic optical trap and we, they, that uh, serves as a source of uh, uh, of the rubidium that is the atom that we used in this experiment and so the the rubidium atoms are pushed to the center of this cell and there they are they are uh, laser cooled and trapped and in order to make uh, our experiments and now, so how we do our measurements? As we don't have a, a, a in situ measurements properly, we perform time of flight measurements that you all know well. So we produce the cloud, uh, atomic cloud within the trap, and once it, it's uh, uh, stable there, we release it uh, to, to fall and expand isothermally. And, and then we use an imaging beam to probe its cross-section. And uh, after that, we, we need to identify if this, it, has, it has both condenser or not. So we fit the proper uh, density profile to data. So this is the uh, typical profile for purely thermal clouds. So we have just uh, the, uh, a Gaussian profile that, uh, that obeys the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And in the case of a, a, a Bose condensed cloud, it appears among the among the, the Gaussian profile uh, uh, this um, quadratic, uh, this parabola profile that that is the that comes from the uh, Thomas Fermi theory, uh, and this is the, of course the profile of the Bose condensed atoms. And then once we we have probed and um, and fit the proper density profile to data we apply the custodian regression in order to recover the in situ profile so we don't really uh, probe the profile the in situ profile directly but uh, we perform this uh, time of flight measurements let the, the cloud to expand and then we apply this uh, ca this custodian regression to, to recover the in situ profile. And then having the in situ profile, we can, uh, we can find the, the, we can have the, we have, as we have now the density, and we have measured previously, previously the trap frequencies, we can find for each cloud its pressure parameter. And uh, of course, we, we perform uh, many uh, many measurements uh, we create a very big set of data uh, that uh, in order to as w once we have uh, all those measurements we now we need to fix the number of atoms so uh, in a lower dispersion so, uh, so we for a fixed uh, for fixed trap frequencies that means a fixed volume parameter 
and also the, the fixed number of atoms, we now can determine the, the equation of state as a function only of uh, temperature. But the question is, how to do that? So now come the two approaches that I just told you. And the first approach is the fitting approach. So um, once we, for each cloud, uh, in a constant number of atoms, in, in a constant uh, volume parameter, we, we can, we can uh, find the, the profile of, of the pressure parameter versus temperature. We now need to, to know how, how, how the, uh, what's the behavior of this function. So if you remember well, the, the Bose condensed part in an ideal gas obeys a, a T to 4 behavior. So we, we proposed this model, the, this, this approach, that below the critical temperature, it, it, it must obey also a, a, a T to 4 behavior, but we include uh, a dimensionalless term that just to see if there is any deviation from from the from the profile uh, that that the ideal gap the ideal gas uh, has, and uh, we have all the those terms that are found, and we know that above the critical temperature, it must obey the Gay Lussac's law. So we expect that this should be uh, um, a linear behavior, and, uh, and th this is the approach. But as an approach, it has some advantages and uh, disadvantages. And in, the, in this case, the advantage, it predict, uh, we can predict the whole behavior of the pressure parameter for the, uh, the full range of temperature. So using this approach, we can predict what are the effects of uh, the zero temperature. So you know, if we put here uh, T equal to zero, this uh, B3 uh, term is the uh, zero point pr uh, pressure parameter. So we can uh, uh, extract the, the zero, uh, zero point energy and other properties in the zero temperature. But uh, the, the, the disadvantage of this, this map, it overshoots the critical temperature. So as I would show you now, the critical temperature is higher than it should be. Uh, this math, the, this approach, cannot predict uh, well the critical temperature in this case. So now, uh, this, so this is the, uh, the, the uh, t uh, equation of state plotting for two, uh, two different number of atoms. They are very close, but you see here the, disper uh, the dispersion in this case is 3% and in this case is 1%. And in both cases, uh, this beta 2 term that is the component is it's the its order of magnitude is 10 to minus 5 so we can consider that the the system the system still obeys the t to 4 behavior as this uh, dimensional dimensional term is very small and then the, this this green line i don't know if you can see you, uh, it, but this is a green line this uh, solid line is the ideal gas profile and the points here and following the, the, this line are the measurement. Uh, and this is the fitting profile. So we see here, in, in the case of a finite system uh, in a weakly interacting gas, the critical temperature is expected to be negative, negatively shifted from the ideal gas profile. So in fact, what w we would expect is that is the critical temperature to be after, uh, uh, before the, this point here. So it should not be here, but it's, it would be, uh, should be more or less here. But still, uh, it, follows, it, it follows the profile the, that this system should have. Uh, and that's why we, it's still good, then we can predict the, the where, where uh, extrapolate where the, this curve go and it has the, has the zero zero point effects of this, and then having the the equation of state, uh, we we can use the results that that the the, the internal energy is three times the pressure per, uh, the pressure parameter times the volume parameter, and as the volume parameter and the number of, of atoms are fixed, we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, find the heat capacity just at the derivative of the 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 equation of state. The, in, in resp with respect to temperature. So 
we see here that w the, the classical sharp peak for for the heat capacity that uh, that is, uh, it should have, but in fact, uh, as I just told you, uh, the critical temperature is overshoot, and as the system is is is, is finite, uh, this should be not so sharp. In fact, and and this, the second approach I will show you, uh, we will take this account, and then we are not going to see this very sharp uh, peak here, but a more a more smooth profile that follows a, a line here and and then goes to the to the to the straight line part here. Um, and once we have a heat capacity, and as the the volume uh, and the volume parameter and the number of atoms are fixed, we can also have the entropy profile. So we just uh, we, we we have the, this relation that comes from the differential uh, differential heat, and isolating the the differential of entropy uh, of entropy here, we can just integrate this equation uh, in, we, using the heat capacity pro profile from the last graph. And, and have the how, how the entropy of a, a weakly interacting boson gas be, uh, behaves, and we have uh, we have this profile, and above the critical temperature, we see here that follows a logarithmic profile that we 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 have we know that uh, is expected to to uh, a bo a bo uh, any kind of gas to have, and as we have now. The 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 equation of state and the entropy. If we we can determine the the Gibbs potential, and once we determine the, the Gibbs potential, we just need to divide it to the the total number of atoms to have the chemical potential, and then uh, we, this this is a very exciting result we have. Below the critical temperature, uh, as as we know, the chemical potential goes to zero, and we observed the, the this profile. So uh, it goes to zero as it should go for uh, both gas below the critical temperature, and then uh, after that it it, it, it increases for uh, in, in in the negative to to the negative numbers, decrease to negative numbers. Sorry. Um, and oh, of course, and uh, uh, beyond the 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 chemical potential, we also have the Myers relation be obeyed. So, as we have now the internal energy, we know the, uh, the pressure parameter and the volume parameter. We can also have the enthalpy, and having the enthalpy, we can have the the heat capacity at constant constant pressure parameter, and this means that we can have the the Meyer relations. And above the critical temperature, as we all know, it goes to one uh, because this one is the R, the the constant, uh, the ideal gas constant. Uh, 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 that is the number of atoms times the the Boltzmann constant, and but it obeys a different behavior below the critical temperature as it should be. But uh, uh, as, uh, once again, uh, it overshoots the critical temperature. We have must have uh, have a better uh, estimate of, of of the critical temperature now if we want to uh, study what happens in the transition point. So this least square interpolation approach. Is a it's a, a little bit more complicated. We take into account more terms to describe the 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 both condensed part, and here this uh, this threshold temperature is the is where the 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 thermal cloud points and the both condensed part start to start to appear together. So this is not really the critical temperature, no, but the critical temperature is in between this point, the minimal temperature that we have in our data set, and, uh, and the threshold temperature. And we observe that above the critical temperature is no problem to, to have the, 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 uh, the linear behavior because it obeys quite well the gay lussac law. So we kept this for in the above the critical uh, above the threshold temperature, but we extended the 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 the, the number of terms in, in the both condensed part, also keeping the number of atoms and the volume parameter all constant. And then, as, as well, has advantages and disadvantages. And so this this uh, approach 
uh, estimate correctly the critical temperature, so it is negative, negatively shifted as it should be. And we don't have the sharp peak in the transition because a finite system that doesn't have the sharp peak. And then uh, once we have the, the correct estimate of te critical temperature and uh, we know that it for, uh, the profile now is correct, we can study the, what happens in this transition. We can, uh, as I will show you, extract the critical exponent for, for the heat capacity. But the disadvantage, you know, this in, the interpolation approach, all the interpolation approach, does not consider the full interval in temperature. You have like uh, this is only valid between the minimum value in temperature that you have, and uh, between this value and the maximum value in temperature. So you cannot extrapolate what happens b below this. You, you can, but not. Uh, you need uh, to include. Would need to uh, to include more terms. But it's not the case using this, this approach. The, only this formula, just consider the, the interval that we have in our data set. Uh, and then, so these uh, are the results for the equation of states. So those, all the colors here are, are density parameters. So the, is the total number of atoms divided by the volume parameter, the ver uh, very different, uh, many values of volume parameter here. And they are all normalized by the, the critical pressure and the, the critical temperature. So we see here, the, uh, this is the linear behavior that we have. And the threshold temperature should be more or less here, is where the, 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 this polynomial, uh, this fourth general fourth degree polynomial behavior starts to disappear. And it starts to, to go to a, uh, a straight line behavior. So the, the threshold temperature is more or less here, but the critical temperature is, is, is below it. So we see here now it's negatively shifted, as it should be uh, for a weakly interacting finite system. And uh, of course, we, we determine the, the critical temperature uh, where the, the, the derivative of, of do, those points are the maximum, so is where the, the peak in the heat capacity will be. I, I will show you in the, in the next slide. And uh, the critical pressure, of course, is where the, the, the critical point in the, uh, for the critical temperature is. So now the heat capacity. Uh, for all, for all, all the colors here, all, all the, the, the density parameters here, uh, we, we could take the derivative, multiply by 3 times the volume parameter, and now we, we have the heat capacity profiles around the critical temperature. And uh, we see here that the peaks in the heat capacity are, lie all in the critical, the critical point, as it should be, the, the, the critical temperature point. And above it, it starts going the, the constant behavior that we observe for, for in gases, uh, in the in, in gases in uh, in general way, and we see here is not sh a sharp profile as before. In the in the fitting approach, we had the the heat capacity, but with a sharp profile, uh, the sharp peak in the critical uh, critical point. But uh, now what we have is the is the in the critical point, it's more rounded. And then, uh, this, the, and this is a spectre for a finite system. And now, uh, as we have the correct estimate of the critical temperature, and we know that this is the correct profile, we can extract, we can find the, the critical exponent for the heat capacity, the, uh, as we may know, is the called alpha. So we define the reduced temperature as one minus the, 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 the critical temperature, temperature divided by the critical temperature. We define the dimensionless uh, heat capacity as the heat capacity volume, uh, constant volume, volume parameter divided by the NK. And, and then we, we, we take this alpha, which is uh, also called the uh, uh, ordered phased uh, critical exponent as the limit of the logarithm of, of the, this, this ratio of the logarithms when this uh, t goes to zero. So we see here, from this definition, this t here, the, this point will be zero, and then th this part will be negative. 
So we are going to, we are going to take uh, the the critical exponent in this part how the how the system behaves around this point but below the critical temperature. And then uh, this should uh, as this is a critical exponent it should obey one of the hyperscale relations. And in this case we have the uh, this relation that is well known. Uh, this uh, this is the the system dimension which is three it's three as the the system is three dimensional and this uh, uh this new ex uh, exponent has been measured before in code in code atoms by uh, in 2007 and from our measurements we observed that uh, we found that we, this critical exponent uh, it has this value and then if we compare both we s we see their math uh, within the experimental error, so they they are, are the same within the experimental error. And now, as the end of the discussion, and I, I would like to, uh, here I, I I made a, a not so long presentation just to to hear wh what you think about this 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 global variable math, and it's good to have some feedback from the community. Uh, as this is a very new approach that just our group and the group from Professor Romero at Mexico works on. Um, so as, as you saw, we studied the non-uniform uh, both gas using the global variable math, and we are, uh, we are worried to, uh, to find the, crit uh, the thermodynamic properties of that system around the, the critical temperature. And Use, uh, once we determine the, the, those properties, we could find the, the f uh, ordered phase the, uh, critical exponent, which is this alpha, and it seems to satisfy one of the hyperscale law, as I just showed you. And as, the pro as, as I just told you in the beginning, this is the experimental work. Uh, we, I just show you here uh, uh, results from our experiments, our measurements. So w we now uh, are working on uh, to extract the crit critical exponents for beta and kappa uh, that are other um, thermodynamic quantities. And this is ongoing. We are we are still discussing. Uh, I I should have presented this, but I we didn't have time yet to discuss, and there are some details that we we are still struggling to how to solve it, how to measure properly, how to extract the, the proper derivatives as, you know, th those quantities are, are derivative from the volume parameter. So uh, it's not easy to perform numerical derivative from from experiment, experimental point as you, you know. So we are still discussing how to do this properly in a way that we have a, a better signal rate uh, uh, signal noise uh, rate uh, this is uh, should be reduced and then uh, we want to reproduce our our data using numerical simulation probably this part will be done by professor Romero at Mexico so we as w and once we have tho those two things we are going to p publish a, a very big paper as Vanderlei wants but uh, I, w I would like uh, I must tell you that uh, I would like first to to publish a, a smaller paper, just some PRA, or uh, to uh, using the, uh, just having the critical exponents for all those quantities, but this is still a thing that we are discussing. Uh, and then, as we know, Vanderlei uh, likes very much this thing about turbulence. He's very turbulent mani maniac, <laughs> so he wants to. He has this idea to extend this this formalism, this gl this global variable math to non-equilibrium phenomena. Uh, he, his main idea is that to uh, extra, to measure compressibility and uh, a, a expansion for, for a turbulent fluid, you, usually people use uh, the globe, uh, local density approximation, as you know. But the problem is, once you have a turbulent fluid, uh, uh, the density fluctuations is very high, so it's it's really hard to to perform calculation using local density approximation. So what Vanderlei wants is to somehow uh, create the uh, extend this uh, this methodology to non equilibrium and then use it as you sh uh, just show you. It's quite powerful. We could uh, we could consider a non homogeneous system as homogeneous in its 
in its formalism and uh, it, we could find a very interesting uh, it show it obeys quite well the, all the 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 thermodynamic relations that a gas should should have and uh, we could also measure uh, very well the this critical gas product which usually is a very difficult tax task so I will let you now to to destroy me. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you, Marcos. Very clear. So, uh, question here, Matthias. Oh yeah. No destruction. No destruction. No, no. <laughs> no, no. Just a question. I I remember that people measured this equation of state for the Fermi gases. Oh really? Uh, yeah. Somehow, uh, I also remember that there was this paper. Uh, by Ho and others uh, 10 years ago maybe also extracting these thermodynamic variables from a measurement in an inhomogeneous system. So how does your approach compare to this? Well, if I remember well this paper on f uh, fermionic system, uh, 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 I think they expressed this in, in terms of, of potential. I, I, uh, I don't remember well. Do you? Ah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I remember. But the difference between that approach and our approach, we are as as we don't have in situ measurement. Uh, we we cannot uh, measure in situ, but they they could. So they have this uh, const uh, phase co contrast imaging. That's the so they 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 could find the the extract the the, the density profile and then they express this uh, as a. Uh, in terms of the external potential, if I'm not wrong. My question would be, if you now take this approach, I, I experimentally, I guess maybe it requires different approaches, but if you took this analysis and would then uh, look at your formalism that you were using to analyze it, maybe it is the same, or do, did you try that? Might be ah, okay. Ah, that. okay. Uh, uh, now also, I there's the question of how do I extract these kind of thermodynamic variables that make sense at the end in terms of equations of state? Mm -hmm. How do I connect them to measurable density uh, profiles and or uh, the profiles as of the kind that you're doing? So, did you try to see whether this formalism is maybe the same? Where they connect Romero's to the usual term thermodynamics. Okay. okay. Now, I, now, now I got your point. Yes. So, there's a there's a ma uh, master student uh, doing this right now. He is trying to connect how how f how the things convert between the global variable mapped and the local density approach. So um, the idea is to to see once we have the me uh, the measurements from the local density, how how ca how can we we use them to reproduce the global variable mapped? So yes, so yes, this is the this is the thing we are also worried about. Uh, we still don't know that. No, yes, uh, but uh, we are worth just to publish, and yes, and we wonder wants to make a very big paper on this. He he dreams a lot. So, what are the uncertainties in the measured quantities and number and and uh, trap frequencies? Um, and so we measure the temperature. the trap frequencies. And from the from the density profile, we can measure the the, the total number of atoms, the 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 size of the cloud. What are the uncertainties in these quantities? So, in, in one of the um, one mm. of the last slides you showed, the data ah, okay. slides. Okay, I five percent. Yes, I, I forgot this. Sorry. This this one. So yes, do, for the five percent. So, so you give the atom number in three digits, but I'm sure it's not that accurate. So, mm. what is your what is your uncertainty in in number and temperature and and trap frequencies? So, he, in the number is five percent, right? Yeah. And in temperature, um, you know, the the point the points here, each point here represents a temperature. So we don't really ha measure the uncertainty in, in temperature. So the only thing we should have the uncertainty in the critical temperature. But um, I need to check this. I I don't remember right now. This is a thing I've, I really forgot. Yeah. So, but you do extract the temperature, so you must measure the temperature as well. Yeah. 
Yes. So how, how do you do that? As, as we perform the time of flight measurements, we extract the, the temperature from the thermal cloud expansion. So this is the way we, and as the, as the expansion is isothermal, then we, we know that the temperature for the expanded cloud is the same as the, the in situ clouds. That's the way we, we found. And so is that, those uncertainties come into the uncertainty in the critical parameter? Yes. Yes, it has yeah. been taken into account. Yes, so the, this are, I just forgot this in, in yeah. this graph. Yes, can yes. Can you advance to the next slide? Because I think you have the, yeah, the critical exponent here. So you have a something that looks like an uncertainty of, what, about 10%, I guess, 10 or 20%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You talk about the weak interacting regime. If you make it stronger, how do you expect all these relations? They will be everything blow up, or it can be extended to a not so weak interacting. Mm. It's a very good question. <laughs> well, uh, I remembered in the in this paper from 2005, the it on it has only been considered the. Uh, the case of uh, weak interactions. I don't know w w what would be different between uh, in the strong in the strong interacting case. Um, let me think. Many things are working because in the weak interacting regime, you are, let's say, close to the uh, to the harmonic oscillator that everything works every works well and you can do everything. But when you detach from this, uh, there will be, there can be a nice surprises. So it will be interesting to see making flashback resonance and make it stronger interacting and make the same measure and see how it can be extended. Well, I know in our experiments, we don't have yet the, the flashback coils to produce the fashba resonance, but in the other experiment from uh, Cuvia that has been there yesterday, uh, they have it. Uh, so yes, this is a good proposal. They, they can turn the interaction. Yes, I, I have, but I have no clue what would happen. But as, as you told, of course, uh, as we, we are in the weak interacting case, and yes, uh, that's why we, we can uh, have the, the, the internal energies only as three times the pressure parameter times the volume parameter, yes. Just an expansion, right, uh, from the Vero uh, coefficients. So what is the role of the interactions in your current measurement? How do the interactions oh, yeah. that, that, are, that are present are affecting the data? Yes. So you see here, uh, uh, in the in the fitting profile and the fitting approach, we can uh, extract the zero uh, the zero point effects uh, in in the cloud, right? So this green line is where it, it, the, the ideal gas goes uh, when the temperature goes to, to zero. And we see here that, that in all, the, all, the, all the graphs, that we have, all, all, our measurements, we see a, a, sh a positive shift in, in, the, in the zero point uh, pressure parameter. So it increases the pressure. This is the thing we observed. Is, is this difference? Yes, yes. Do you try to account for that using burial coefficients or something like yeah, that? Yeah, this will be a uh, next thing is in the prospect, yes. But uh, we don't know yet why. Well, I think it's more or less expected from if we think uh, in a van der Waal gas, right? Uh, I think there should be uh, some some kind of thing, in the, uh, some increasing pressure uh, as we have the, the finite molecules. Uh, mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Further questions? Now let's thank Marcus again for a very nice talk. Thank you very much.